Tak for det. And please come on stage. Og øh, som de gjorde sidst, så vil de, øh, de formentlig sidde ned og have en øh, snak. Øh, det er måden, de forkynder på. Jeg lovede lige at blive heroppe til at læse et bibelvers op, som måske er et andet, end hun har sagt, siden hun står og kigger sådan på mig. So, you are talking to me like I know what you're saying. <laughs> I would say I, yes. I hope the Holy Spirit would translate. I would never just say yes to this man. I always say yes to Soren. <laughs> Okay, we got different tempers, so I'm glad I, I would have thought it like that, <laughs> that you would say no and he would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having us this morning. We would like to do something a little different, even just for us. Um, we really want to have a conversation around scripture and discover where God is in that. And so we don't have a script for you this morning, um, and our hope in that, being two people who are not experts in anything, that as people of God we can come together, and we can search his word, and we can find him there, as he reveals himself to us through his word, and through our discussion, and our wisdom, and our understanding of life, and what we bring to the table. And so this morning we're going to have scripture read, and Henry and I are just going to kind of talk about it, um, and really just give you an opportunity to listen, and the goal in that is that it would inspire you to say, I'm not sure I understand what that means, or I didn't ever think of it that way. And then when we're done, we can continue the conversation in the cafe. Cafe over there. Over there. Yeah. <laughs> I trust Soren. So, you trust Soren. <laughs> <laughs> You're a brave man. Brave man. <laughs> yeah. You gave me ice cream. <laughs> Actually, det var Jalop der betalte for den is. Det var ikke mig. Men bare lad dem gå i tron. So we so got second Corinth or oh. second Corinthians three in your Bibles. Two Corinthians three. I told you to end at one. I want you to end. 7 through 7? Okay. So we læser Paulus' andet brev til Korintherne, kapitel 3, vers 7, indtil kapitel 4, vers 7. 7. Thank you. Det står på side, nu skal jeg lige se, 1053 i min. Og der står, Men når dødens tjeneste, indhugget i sten med bogstaver, havde sin herlighed, så at Israels børn ikke kunne se på Moses ansigt på grund af hans ansigts stråleglans, der dog forsvandt. Hvor meget mere vil så ikke åndens tjeneste have sin herlighed? Når den tjeneste, der fører til fordømmelse, havde sin herlighed, så er den tjeneste, der fører til retfærdighed, langt mere rig for herlighed. Det, der var herligt, har jo i dette tilfælde ingen herlighed sammenlignet med den alt overvældende herlighed. For når det, der forsvandt, havde sin herlighed, så skal det, der bliver ved med at bestå, have endnu større herlighed. Et sådan håb har vi, og går derfor åbent til værkets. Og gør ikke som Moses, der lagde et slør over sit ansigt, for at Israels børn ikke skulle se, at det, der forsvandt, hørte op. Dog forhærdedes deres tanker, for indtil den dag i dag, bliver det samme slør ved med at ligge over oplæsning af den gamle pagt, uden at tages bort, for de fjernes først i Kristus. Ja, lige til i dag ligger der et slør over deres hjerter, når Moses læses op. Men hver gang en vender om til Herren, tager sløret bort. Herren er ånden, og hvor Herrens ånd er, der er der frihed. Og alle vi, som med utilsløret ansigt i et spejl skuer Herrens herlighed, forvandles efter det billede. Vi skuer fra herlighed til herlighed, sådan som det sker ved den Herre, som ånden er. Og derfor bliver vi ikke modløse i den tjeneste, som vi har fået af barmhjertighed. Vi har sagt nej til det skjulte og skændige, og går ikke frem med, sm- med snedighed og forfalsker heller ikke Guds ord, men bringer sand- sandheden for dagen og anbefaler således os selv, os selv til et hvert menneskes samvittighed for Guds øjne. Og hvor et evangelium tilhyllet, er det kun tilhyllet for dem, der fortabes. For dem, der ikke tror, deres tanker 
har denne verden Gud blindet. Så de ikke ser lyset, der stråler fra evangeliet om Kristi herlighed. Kristus, som er Guds billede. For vi prædiker ikke selv, men Jesus Kristus, som er Herren, og os selv, som jeres tjenere, for Jesus skyld. Til Gud, der sagde, at mørke skal lys skinne frem. Han har lavet det skinne i vores hjerter til oplysning og til kundskab om Guds herlighed for Jesu Kristi ansigt. Men denne skat, men denne skat har vi i lærekar, for at den ikke overvældende kraft skal være Guds og ikke vores. Yes. Thank you. So what jumped out to you this morning? I think there's a couple things. I think the first thing um, for me personally is in verse 7, when it says that the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, being the commandments that Moses brought, it came with such glory. I don't know that I ever associate or put um, an upholding and glory to the law of God. It's always something that um, suppresses me, I guess, or um, keeps me limited. And so I don't associate that with glory. You? The part that, that hit me this morning, oh, there's so much. Right? When you, when you read a chunk of scripture, there's so much depth there. Um, last night as I was looking at it, uh-oh, you switching me? Er det um, på toren? Hey, 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 hey. Der er stadigvæk ikke noget. Det er fint, så får du den her stund. Hvis du fatter, hvad jeg siger. Det gør du nok ikke. Du er... <laughs> Don't. Uh, så prøver vi firen, Christian. Check, check, check. Eller så får du min. Check, 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 check. Let me go ahead, though. You want to vamp for a while? Hey, now it's working. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, that's kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the veil thing kind of, kind of hit me. The, um, how it says in verse 13, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. I don't know what that means. I, I think the two are, are one and the same, actually. Is when, when you brought it up, that, that we often don't see God's law for what it is. And I think that's because when we, when we flip back to Exodus, which would be Moses 2. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm learning. So in Moses 2, or the second book of Moses we have to realize that when they got the law, the, the mitzvot, the what you should do and shouldn't you do, they were coming from a place of oppression. I, I think we forget that a lot, that, that they had, the law wasn't given until after the Exodus. So they weren't oppressed anymore. Correct. But they didn't know how to live as anything but oppressed. Hmm. Have you seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Uh-huh. I love the scene in that movie where the older prisoner, he was arrested, he had spent his entire life in prison, mm-hmm. and he, he was let out of prison, and he got a job at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. And he asked if he, he was, he was a grown man, he wasn't a child, but in prison he had to ask every time he wanted to use the bathroom. And he had literally trained his physical body that he couldn't go to the bathroom physically. 
something very natural, very normal, unless he asked permission. And so he'd lay in his apartment at night going, who do I ask? Um, And he worked at the grocery store, and he said, I couldn't go unless I asked. The problem with Israel is they had lived under oppression so long that they didn't know how to not live under oppression. So they they didn't even have a framework for, if I want something, and I'm a slave... I have no access to resources. I have no access to money. If I grow something, Pharaoh owns it, and he can steal it away. That's his right because I'm his slave. I don't know how to live and get what I need without stealing. And so the commandments when God gave them were law that said, hey, here's how you live as a free people. He had given the gift of freedom, Mm -hmm. but he gave the law going, it's easy for us to go back to what we know. At least that's how I've always read the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came glory. Because they knew how to live in a new way now, It was articulated through the Ten Commandments, but it always brought death because they always slid back to those old patterns. Interesting. Why, what's your read on it? I, um, for me, it was always, we have this sinful nature in us, and so um, it's the, we talked about it earlier in a different Bible study where we have our new identity in Christ. At the same time, we have our old sinful nature. And, and we have choices, and we always are trying to move towards always living in that baptismal identity mm-hmm. and that struggle of Paul. So for me, the commandments were always this... Um, I way to help keep you protected um, from saying these are your boundaries. I have my kids. Um, we, live in, uh, we live in a pretty tough neighborhood uh, where I live, and so we have rules about where they can go, where they can ride their bikes. They're not allowed to freely go outside and play. And so for me, those are to keep them safe. So it was... Not no, I never thought about the coming from a place of oppression that that's a helpful tool, but it was always a, I know what is naturally in you to be selfish, to be greedy, to, to want sin for your own self. And so this is a way to help protect you, I guess. And I think we're saying the same thing but from two very different um, vantage points. Because when we look at the whole story, where we start the story really, really matters. If we start the story in exile, that is, you've just been delivered from Mm -hmm. Pharaoh's hand of oppression, and oppression is your memory, then the law takes on a very, very different... Um, sorry, Frederick, I was going to say connotation. Um, understanding. understanding. Yeah. Where if you're coming from a place of freedom, it takes on a, a different understanding. And so we have this mm-hmm. problem in the church of some of us have never not known Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So when I look at this, this crowd... Some of us were baptized when we were just babies. And so our whole life, we've been hearing that Jesus loves us. We've been hearing that we are God's children. We've been hearing that, and we don't remember a time when we didn't hear that message. So sometimes the law, having always lived in freedom, seems restrictive. But then in, the, in this room, there's others 
that they were raised without Jesus. They didn't hear, they, they understood the law that God was mad at them and that it wasn't until later in life that they heard that God loved them. And so then the law takes on a very different Weren't they always hear, Sorry. Weren't they always hearing that Yahweh loved them? I mean, isn't that the basis for why Moses brought them out of Egypt? I don't think so. I think that some of them really question that. That is, if you're getting... If you're being tortured every day and being a slave every day and not experiencing that, it's easy to start questioning. I would agree. And that was their their experience that they brought to God. And I think there's something really important about that, that, that we do bring our experience to the table. It's the only way we can read scripture is based on the good and the bad that's happened to me and my understanding of, of life and what's happened. I read scripture through that lens. So, yeah. so what did you get? Um, besides that, what else did you see in there? Um, let's, let's flip back to, to 2 Corinthians, number, chapter 3, verse 13. Um, what jumped out to me, it says, we are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face. And I had to look that up because I didn't, I didn't remember that. I didn't remember when Moses had put a veil over his face. And it's in Second Moses 35, 29. And, and what had happened is Moses had went up on the mountain and, and God looked at Moses and he, he said to him, I will, and the word, the word in Hebrew is actually Hebrew. The word Hebrew means to cross over. That you're going to be here and I'm going to cross over in front of you and when I do that, you are going to see, and the word he uses there is this intriguing word that we've talked about a lot, is tov. Now in English it's translated as goodness, but in Genesis it's got a whole richer meaning. So just put that in the back of your head because we'll get to there in a second. But Moses had this experience with God. This time where he, he saw where God had been and where God was going, and he saw the fullness of what God was doing, and he felt it, and he experienced it. And so then... He gave them this law, this Ten Commandments, and Moses went back down to the people. And there was something different about Moses. That the way Moses had been shaped by God when he was alone with God changed Moses. Is this, is this where he aged when he came back down from the mountain? Um, some people translate it that way. Um, some people, I think the right translation is that his face glowed. Mm. They said there was a glow about him. And I've had that experience with people that you look at them and you can tell that something's different. It's like you have that friend and, and they went off to a camp or they went off to a retreat or they went off just to work that day and you come back and you're like, okay, something's different. You're, you're exuding joy. And I think that's what, what happened with Moses. And it's in, in, second, in second Moses 34, 29. And I'm just going to read it really quickly because it's, it's amazing what Paul does with this verse. It says that when Moses came down from the mountain, 
with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hand, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. See, Moses wasn't aware of it. Moses wasn't aware of... uh, He was aware that the, the change had happened in his heart, but he wasn't aware that other people could see it. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses' face... It was radiant, and they were afraid to come nearer to him. And I love that concept, because how often is there the change in me, and I go back into my community like everything was normal, and people interact differently. But Moses called to them, this is verse 31, but Moses called to them, so Aaron And all the leaders of the community came back to them, and he spoke with them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near to him, and he gave them all the commandments that the Lord had given him on Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Um, Hey, Soren. Do they do veils for weddings here? Um, no. Okay, then I'm not going to go down that path because it would make no cultural context sense. So, so he hid his face. But what Paul does here, it's amazing. We're back in 2 Corinthians now. He says, we are n- 2 Corinthians 13, we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. And I wonder how often, when I was a child, I'd go to camp, and I'd have this great experience of God, and I'd feel close to God, and somebody, usually my mom, would point out, hey, Henry, you're acting different. You're nicer to your brother. You're you're helping with the dishes. A change has happened in you. But then as time would go on, it felt different in my heart. And like Moses, I, I felt that that was bad. And so I tried to pretend to be something that I'm not. And I think that that's where the law messes with us. I feel like I should say something to that, but I was stuck on the um, the radiance and the looking different. Mm-hmm. That you would see somebody who looks different, and it made me think of Jacob. Um, in Genesis, when Jacob wrestles with God. So you have Moses, who's meeting with God on the mountain, and he has this experience, and he comes away visibly different. And then you have, so I, it made me think of Jacob, who wrestled with God, not, um, not it's a very close sport, where it's all arms and legs and body contact, so it's very close. It's this personal, intimate encounter with God. And Jacob um, means heal. That's what his name means, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have, um, I had read, we had studied together that blessing means knee. And when we had talked about praying, is that correct? Mm Mm-hmm. And we were talking in Bible study earlier this week. Now, real quick, what we're, what we're saying here is in the Hebrew language, every name has a meaning. Now, I don't know if that's how it works in Danish. In English, Henry just means me. It doesn't mean anything else. You don't look at Henry and go, oh, that means great ruler although that's what it means in England. Um, So I'll move there. Um, But but Jacob 
when you hear the word Jacob in Hebrew, you instantly, it's the same word as heal. And what you're saying is knee? Well, blessing means knee, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about that is when we were talking about praying and being on our knees, you receive this blessing in communication with God. So you have Jacob, that means heal. Blessing, that means knee. And when he wrestled with God, his hip was wounded in the story. In the first book of Moses, chapter 32. And I'm not going to quote it. But to me, when you wake up and it is this image, this representation of when he walked away from wrestling in this private and intimate connection and moment with God, he walked away, he walks different. If your hip is wounded, you walk different. He received a blessing by being on his knees in communication with God. And I liked that image of when you have this encounter, this moment, this experience with God, you cannot help but walk away being different, looking visibly different for others to see and to know. That's what I was thinking. So let's go there. Let's go to to the first book of Moses. Um, And let's, I want to give, um, let's go 30-ish. And to give a context here, what's, what's intriguing is to understand Jacob's heel that we bring our own, we were talking about our context, we bring our own baggage to that, don't we? Mm-hmm. That when I hear heal, I think, um, I think bad. The reason he was named heal is because when he was born, he had, he had his brother Esau and him, and he grasped on to his heel when he was born. And it says that Esau was this hairy warrior and Jacob was the tag-along, the kid pulling at the robe. And as you go through the story, with, right before we get to this wrestling, two things have happened. Number one, the deception. That he had went to his father and his father said, Who are you? And sorry, just quick sidebar. If you don't know these stories, we are intentionally in this Bible study we've had this conversation and so we're not going to go through the whole story but I want to encourage you if you're sitting here going I've never heard that story before to talk to a person that you're with that, that you really leave this place and continue this conversation so the first thing he did is he wanted to be somebody else he went to his dad and he said I am Esau. I'm not who I know that I am. He knew that he wasn't Esau. He knew that he was Jacob. But he pretended to be Esau. But the only way he ever ended up figuring that out is the Rachel Leah story. which Only figured out what? That he wasn't being who he was. That he was pretending to be something that he wasn't. He didn't understand the hurt until he had been hurt. With Rachel and Leah. With Rachel and Leah. Hmm. Which, I've always wanted to, every time I do premarital counseling, I try to talk the couple into letting me do this as their, as their sermon. Marrying the wrong woman? <laughs> yeah. That's why, maybe that's why nobody will ever do it. But... <laughs> Maybe on purpose. <laughs> God's blocking me from being heard. Uh-huh. Um, do you want to tell the story? Just for my time. 
Well, I... I oh, did I push the... Oh, there's a mute on this. <laughs> Sword is so technical. So, no, I think that it's the picture of marriage. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that it didn't really happen. I think that, that a real man really named Jacob was really deceived by his father-in-law, that he really um, worked for Rachel and married Leah. I think the whole story's real. But I think it points to something even bigger. That in marriage, w when I married my wife, I went in with all kinds of expectations of how marriage was going to be. I went in only having ever seen marriage from the outside. I had never been married before. And so when I stepped into marriage, I woke up that first morning and I looked at her and a um, panic struck me. I hope you didn't tell her that. <laughs> she was still asleep. <laughs> But a panic struck me because I realized that I knew how to date my wife. Mm. I knew how to plan a wedding, but I had no clue how to be a husband. Mm. And I had stood before my parents and her parents and taking these vows to love her and honor her and cherish her through sickness and through health. until death and I had no at that moment I knew that I had no idea what I was getting into and I no longer had to love my girlfriend I now had to love my wife and I knew that it was different for Jacob it was a little bit bigger but I think that in the story, he learned to love his wife. So that's why I think it would be so fun to preach at a wedding. His wives? <laughs> okay, maybe it wouldn't preach so well. Um, you, you had talked about Tov. Oh yeah, we need to cover that, don't we? We do. Um, because I think it's important and it's at the essence of if we're talking about salvation today and we have Moses who brought the law and the glory of what that is. Mm -hmm. We have Christ's salvation for us. It, we actually, Christ saves us from something for something. And I know that Tov is at the very center of what that is. Since you mentioned it, I want you to start, explain it a little bit so that we're all on the same page. Okay. So I think that tov, it's translated good. What, what's the word good in Danish? Good? Gul. Like, rul, glul, flul. Gul. So, so there's this word good, but in Hebrew, the word is tov. Let's all say that. Tov. Tov. But the word tov, we're in um, 1 Moses 1. And, and I think the clearest place, actually, let's go to, to 1 Moses 2, 18. In 1 Moses 2.18, after all of creation, God had looked at God had looked at the first day he made light and it was tov. He made, he made seeds in the plants and that was tov. He made animals and they were tov. But then for the first time in 2.18, he looks at Adam and God says, it is low tov. It is not good. Now this isn't saying bad. It's not good and bad. Mm -hmm. It's saying the essence of tov, 
doesn't exist when you're alone. And then he made Adam and Eve. And, and Adam and Eve lived together. Because what Tov is, is Tov is to take what you are and multiply it. When we go to, to 1 Moses 1, 11, God says, and he, and he says this so many times, it's been funny um, with, with Frederick translating this week, that preachers do this, they repeat the same thing over and over and over so that it makes that emphasis. And it's been really fun because he just goes, he's repeating himself. <laughs> it's easier than translating. But, but God does that. He says in verse 11, he says, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, as if there's another kind, you know, those plants that don't have seeds, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to its various kinds, and it was so. And then in verse 12, he repeats it. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds, according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in it. And God saw that it was tov. Can we pause? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's difficult and interesting only because I'm so used to reading it as good and I attach good to a lot of different things. So this moment was really good. That dinner was really good. And I, it always felt like this idea of it was close to perfection and you're, that's not what it means. No, it's not a good... Or evil. Or good, bad. bad. That, that isn't there yet. Okay. God looks at it and it's good. But not good. It's tov. Okay. He makes it tov. And tov... When you look at an apple... Mm -hmm. And you're eating an apple... So often we, we throw away the core of the apple. Now in the Hebrew mindset, in the Genesis mindset, you wouldn't throw that away because that's the tov of the apple. Because in the apple you have the seeds. And in the very nature of an apple, the apple is good because in that apple... The apple is tov. The apple is tov because... In the apple is the potential of a whole orchard of apples. And oftentimes I think in the church, because we haven't explored this topic, we talk about what we've been saved from, Right? Luther said we've been saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Mm -hmm. And that's good. And I rejoice in that. It, it, but I think it goes even farther. That we've not just been saved from our sin, but we've been saved for Tov. That, that when God made you, um, you bear the, uh, the Imago Dei, the image of God. That in you, there are certain seeds that it's your job to tend and to nurture and to make grow and that those toves will echo through eternity. So God doesn't create the world. He doesn't create light and darkness, rivers, land, animals, fruit, vegetation, and people, and call it good. 
the essence of what it is, if I'm hearing you correctly, to say it a different way, is he created life that creates more life. But it doesn't stop there. The life that that creates, creates more life. They create. An apple, right. So an apple with its seed doesn't just produce an orchard. It produces an orchard full of apples that will create more apples. I will pour into my children life and the word of God and the spirit, not so that just their life is changed, but that they in turn go and share life and continue to change and bring the spirit of God here in this place. It's only then that Tov exists. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's exactly right. And I, I, I never want to minimize what we're saved from. I never want to minimize that, that each of us, this isn't unique to me and you because we have a microphone so we get to tell the story. So maybe today we won't even tell our stories because each of you has your stories. You did it at the testimony tent last night. You spoke of what God had saved you from. And so I want to build on that basis, on that assumption, and press into a little bit, what is your tove? What is that thing that God saved you for? Mm -hmm. Because what I'm finding is, is God didn't make an apple in order for the apple to become a peach. Though that would be awesome. Maybe. But isn't that what we spend most of our life doing? <laughs> Trying to be somebody else. I see, <laughs> I see the thing that I admire in you, hmm. and rather than speaking to you and encouraging that, like they did with Moses, saying, I see the glow on your face, I see the, the Imago Dei, image of God in you that so often, because of sin, we don't see in ourselves. And so as the church, I'd say one of the things that we have to do is, is look at our friends and say, Danielle, the things that you are doing with your son, the way you are feeding him, and taking the time to grow a garden isn't just good, it's tov. You are changing a pattern for him that's not just going to affect Noah, but it's echoing through eternity. You're changing his children and his children's children. And that so often when you've spent that day in the garden and you're stinky and you're sweaty and you don't feel good and your arms hurt, you need somebody from the outside to say what you're doing is holy work. And to speak the tove that's already there. Can I read you something that I read this morning? Could I stop you from reading me something that you read this morning? No. <laughs> um, this is a book called No Man is an Island, and it just echoed, I think, very much what we were saying this morning, and especially about living into our purpose, what we are, not what we are saved from, but how what we are saved from pushes us into what we are saved for. He says this, In order to be what we are meant to be, we must know Christ and love him and do what he did. Our destiny is in our own hands since God has placed it there and given us his grace to do the impossible. It remains for us to take up with courage and without hesitation the work he has given us, which is the task 
of living our own life as Christ would live it in us. And to me, that's not living into our old sinful nature of what do I want to do with my life? What am, it's all this I focus. But to live out our tove of what we are saved for is to know Christ and what he has put in us. Which in turn means the most, self, the most selfish act of living for myself is actually selfless as I learn what it is that Christ wants to do in me, through me, for you. That's what I read. And we've got two minutes left. Until we talk in the cafe. And this is, what, <laughs> this is why... we have these conversations on stage. Because the one thing that I've learned is that Scripture is true. That as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. That the only way the veil gets lifted from Moses is for one of his brothers or sisters to speak that truth into his life. And what I've found is there's too many people in this room for me to look at you and say, this is what I see in you. Now I know, looking in your eyes, that you bear the Imago Dei, the image of God. I can see it in your smile. Or you're just freaked out that I'm talking to you. But the person sitting next to you, I can tell by her smile that she could look in your eyes and that you can have this conversation and that you can first celebrate what you've been saved from. That, that Jesus has rescued you through his, his death on the cross. He has rescued each of us, not from sin in a general way, but from specific patterns of hurt and pain in our lives. I want to challenge you all to stop today and to celebrate that. To celebrate what you've been saved from. But then I want to do what Danny just did. Is, is she read this, I want to challenge you to look at that other person and say, here is the tove that is in you. You're, you're an apple, you're not a peach. You can do things to advance the kingdom, not because you're great, not because you're special, but because God put them in you. And that's what he saved you for. And can you imagine the tove of next year? If, if people do this today and, and they talk to each other and they speak that truth into each other's lives and say, this is the good that I see in you, the way that you can talk to your coworker and speak truth into their life and bring Jesus to them is miraculous. Can you imagine what this would look like next year? Because that coworker would hear of Jesus and they would become a Christian and they would come alongside. And, oh. Juicy. It translated. Booyah. Yeah. And so that's what I want to I wanna pray for. Actually, can you pray? I'll pray. So let's pray and then we'll continue the conversation. God, you are good. You are full of goodness. And in that goodness, you pour out your love into our life. You do not leave us alone. But you surround us by your word and your church and your people. God, we praise you for the way your spirit has moved in this place. 
this week. We praise you, God, for the work that you are doing. We thank you, oh God, for not leaving us alone in our sin, in our struggle, in our pain. But you have brought us out of that through your Son, Jesus Christ. And you will work through us to bring your kingdom here on earth. God, I pray that we draw near to you. That you give us courage to say yes to you. And help us to surrender our will to yours. In your son's name we pray. Amen.